So maybe we'll do a lunch and learn. If you are getting hungry, feel free to go grab your lunch and learn a little bit today. Uh, today's presentation, at least today at noon, is our geology in Michigan, as I said. Uh, Dr. Peter Voice is going to be given this presentation. He's from Western Michigan University. Good day, everyone. My name is Peter Voice, and I'm a geologist who works at the Michigan Geological Survey and I teach at the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Western Michigan University. And my area of expertise is the geology of Michigan. I'm involved with mapping out the distribution of different rock types in the state, as well as mapping out the types of resources that are found in those rocks. And today what I wanna to talk to you about is the geology of Michigan. Well, here in the Lower Peninsula, we really don't have much in the way of outcrops to look at. And this is a picture of part of the uh, southern rim of the Grand Canyon, showing layers of rock outcropping at the surface. And geologists can actually walk along these uh, layers, collect samples, uh, make descriptions, and define different rock units. And the lower left image shows the different named rock units uh, that are part of the Grand Canyon stratigraphy that were identified by uh, about 150 years worth of different geologists exploring that area, describing what they saw, and mapping out the distribution of different rock types. Well, in Michigan, we have roughly the same thickness of rock units uh, in the Michigan Basin. But unfortunately, we don't have a canyon that carves through those rock units. So we're stuck looking at other bits of data. So for example, we can look at uh, places along the shorelines where some rock materials outcrop. We can look at subsurface well data. So people drill water wells and oil wells and mineral wells into the subsurface of our state. And when they're doing that drilling, they actually collect samples of material that they drill through, bring those samples to the surface, and then we can study them. And we can observe the more younger uh, earth materials like the glacial sediments and river sediments and dune sediments that have been deposited since the last uh, glacier receded from Michigan about oh, 10,000 years ago. And with close to two centuries of geologists exploring the state of Michigan, people have developed maps of the different rock units. And in this case, we have a specialized version of, geolo of a geologic map that shows the different rock units and their distribution in terms of their age. And so this then sets up Michigan into a couple different packages of rock. And the Western Upper Peninsula, where you see the yellows, grays, and greens, represents the oldest rocks found at the surface in Michigan that are Precambrian in age. And those are crystalline rocks made up of uh, various volcanic and metamorphic rocks. And if we look at the rest of the Upper Peninsula, the Eastern Upper Peninsula, as well as the entirety of the Lower Peninsula, if we were to strip away the glacial sediments, we would find various types of sedimentary rocks that are Paleozoic in age. And these layers of Paleozoic aged sediment are shaped in the form of bowls. So you see this nice bullseye pattern uh, in this map, and the youngest layers, the youngest bowls, are towards the center of the lower peninsula. And as we move out in any direction, those bowls get a little bit older and older and older. And so for example, in the Lower Peninsula, the red rocks are Jurassic in age. And if we go out to uh, the 
northern uh, portion of the eastern upper peninsula, you see the salmon colored uh, layer that is Cambrian in age. And there's about 250 million years between the younger Jurassic rocks and those older Cambrian rocks. The black line represents a profile that someone has drawn to show a cross section of what these layers look like. And so in the next slide, you'll see that cross section. So these layers started out as horizontal layers that were deformed by sediment being piled on top of them, which deformed those layers into bowl shaped structures. And if we look at them in cross section, they would look like this. And the oldest rocks are towards the bottom. And as we move up through that section, we look at younger and younger aged materials. And we have developed those kinds of maps and cross sections from a series of subsurface uh, data sets. And this is one of the data sets that we use is these deeper wells that were drilled in order to find oil and natural gas in the subsurface of Michigan. And most of that uh, exploration was done in the lower peninsula. And there's about 60,000 wells represented on this map that are distinct data points where we actually have samples or other information that was collected about the subsurface geology that we can use to then map out the distribution of different rock types. And in some cases, we actually have uh, beautiful samples of rock that are brought up by using a cylindrical bit that will actually carve out cylinders of rock. And those cylinders of rock are brought to the surface and we call those cores. And this picture shows a set of cores that are in the collection at the Michigan Geological Survey that were collected near Mason, Michigan and represent an aquifer that people were studying in order to understand how groundwater is stored in those rocks. Well, geologists organize our march through Earth's history by using the geologic time scale. And this geologic time scale was built over the 1800s by a whole series of different geologists exploring different parts of the world and figuring out which rocks were older than other rocks. And from that, we're able to organize our discussion of the evolution of life and the evolution of the Earth in this framework. And so this uh, image on the left shows the geologic time scale. And on the right are major events that occurred uh, during geologic time. And in this case, I put basically uh, major, uh, major groups of organisms that evolved, starting with photosynthesizing bacteria about 3.8 billion years ago and going to the present when mammals are dominant. And Michigan actually has a pretty decent coverage of this geologic time scale in terms of the rocks that are preserved here. And we actually find different types of resources here in Michigan scattered through this uh, geologic time scale with iron ore and copper ore as common elements in the Precambrian crystalline rocks, and then the various types of sedimentary rocks like rock salt, gypsum, coal, and sandstone that are found in the Paleozoic sediments and are actually mined here in Michigan. So in the Precambrian rocks, we actually find fossils of bacteria. And this structure here, this a white dome-shaped structure is called a stromatolite. And stromatolites form uh, from the activities of photosynthesizing bacteria. And those photosynthesizing bacteria slowly changed the Earth's atmosphere after they evolved about 3.8 billion years ago. 
slowly adding more and more oxygen to the atmosphere until the oxygen levels got to the point where animals like us could actually breathe the air and use that oxygen in our metabolic activities. And we actually see this change in the oxygen content of the atmosphere recorded in rocks here in Michigan. And this uh, purplish colored outcrop of rock is a special type of rock called banded iron formation. You can see the color bands where there's slightly grayer bands and slightly more reddish bands. Those represent different types of minerals. So the red bands are characterized by jasper, a iron stained quartz, and the gray bands are characterized by minerals like hematite and magnetite. And this banded iron formation, where it's more dominated by the iron bearing minerals, was an incredible economic resource for the state of Michigan. And Michigan actually drove the Industrial Revolution in the United States because we had access to resources like this iron ore. And this graph actually shows the production of iron ore here in Michigan. So on the x-axis, we have time going from 1840 to the present. And on the y-axis, we have uh, total annual production in tons. And over the last uh, about century or so, Michigan has produced somewhere on the order of 15 to 20,000 or 20 million uh, metric tons of steel annually. And that iron ore production has gone into producing uh, structural steel as well as making automobiles. In the 1940s, the highest quality ore was mined out. And in Michigan, uh, the iron mining companies worked together to figure out a process to take lower quality iron ore and concentrate the iron into these little pellets that we call taconite pellets. And you can see the image near the top of the diagram. And that was then sold to market as uh, good quality iron to make steel with. And it actually took an incredible amount of crushing of rock and using magnets to actually filter out the iron bearing minerals uh, to concentrate enough iron ore to make these taconite pellets. And this is one of the uh, buildings that built with structural steel that could have come from Michigan. This is the Waldor Waldorf Astoria in New York City. And you can see the beams being put in place that supported the weight of that building. Uh, Michigan led iron ore production from 1840 to 1900. And then after 1900, Michigan dropped to second place uh, and Minnesota became the dominant iron producer in the US. But those two states have produced the bulk of the iron ore that the United States has produced over the last 150 years. We also find native copper in Precambrian rocks of Michigan. And this is a, actually a pretty special uh, occurrence. Normally we find copper bound up with other elements like sulfur. And so our native copper deposits in the Western Upper Peninsula are pure native copper. And that native copper ended up being another element that was important in the Industrial Revolution here in the US. Initially, the copper produced in Michigan went to making copper fixtures and pipes to support the development of indoor plumbing. And by the late part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, that copper went into producing uh, wiring for electricity. And initially the cities were wired. And then in, from the 1930s, as part of a job program, 
uh, the rural areas outside of the cities were electrified too. You'll see that the copper production here in Michigan goes up and up and up until about 1918, 1919. And in this case, it's not an economic reason for the drop off. Instead, this represents uh, the huge copper deposits of Arizona coming online and out competing the production here in Michigan. If we look at younger Paleozoic rocks in the Michigan Basin, those rocks have produced all kinds of different resources that we use. And one of those resources is rock salt, which is mined commercially in underground mine uh, underneath the city of Detroit. And the lower image actually shows a piece of that rock salt uh, from Detroit. That salt uh, is used primarily for road de-icing um, and is commercially sold for that purpose. And here's various images of products produced uh, from uh, mining salt here in Michigan, uh, water softeners, road de-icing salts, uh, medical grade iodine are all produced here. And in the lower image, you actually see a well. Some of our aquifers in the deeper subsurface are saline enough that people produce salt water from those aquifers and then evaporate off the water to produce these salt compounds. We mine an incredible amount of limestone and dolomite in Michigan. And here at this quarry near Charlevoix, that limestone is being ground up and turned into cement. And we use it then for construction. And interestingly enough, in those uh, Devonian limestones in the Char Charlevoix area and in the Alpena area are fossil bearing. And this is one of the fossils that has been found in those rocks. This is Dunkleosteus, a fossil fish. And this was an enormous animal for the Devonian. And in fact, its body length was about 30 feet long in a full grown individual. They had massively armored front halves and then the back half of the animal was covered in small scales. We also mine rock gypsum here in Michigan. Uh, this is primarily done in uh, the northeastern lower peninsula, but historically was also mined in Grand Rapids. And this is a example of satin spar gypsum, which has a very fibrous uh, texture to it. And that gypsum is ground up and used in cement uh, as plaster and is used in fertilizer as well. And so the drywall that you see on the left is made out of gypsum. Historically, Michigan has produced a lot of bricks and there are factories uh, outside of Grand Ledge. Uh, here's one where you can see the ruins of the factory that produced the bricks that built Detroit and Chicago. And those brick factories were located in Grand Ledge because the local geology had the three ingredients they needed. It had clay from uh, siltstones and shales. It had sand from sandstones. The sand acts as the filler, the clay as the binding agent, and they have to heat that clay and sand up to make the ceramics or brick material. So they locally mined the coal to actually uh, fuel the furnaces that were used to uh, make these bricks. And millions of bricks were made at these fac factories. We also have dimension of dimension stone. And dimension stone is where uh, the miners actually cut blocks of rock that are used to build buildings. And so in the lower right, you see this really pretty colored 
uh, sandstone called the Ionia sandstone. The pretty colors are due to groundwater precipitants that uh, precipitated in this sand as it turned into sandstone. And blocks of this were used to build the building that you see uh, that is the courthouse in Ionia City uh, today. And this Ionia sandstone is a Jurassic age unit and would be the uh, likely place you would want to look if you wanted to find a dinosaur here in Michigan. Unfortunately, uh, so far the only fossils that have been found in that sandstone are Jurassic aged pollen uh, from plant fossils. The last package of uh, geology in Michigan is glacial geology. And the massive ice sheets that spread across North America over the last million years or so deposited incredible amounts of sand, clay, and gravel uh, during the melting of that glacial ice. And so this is a map that shows different types of glacial sediments uh, in Michigan. And this material is also mined locally. And so here's one uh, sand mining operation from uh, mining ancient sand dunes that represented a higher lake level of Lake Michigan. And because this is good, clean, well-sorted sand, it can be used for a variety of uh, products like injection molds in factories or uh, glass materials. And those glacial sediments also bear fossils. And so in the upper left, you see the skull and tusks of a mammoth, and it's upside down uh, in terms of the orientation uh, being pulled out of the ground. And in the lower right, you see the cleaned up skeleton on display at the University of Michigan's museum. So my last thought I want to share with you in terms of Michigan geology is that Michigan mines or extracts billions of dollars worth of minerals every year. And if we were to add up all of the production of these different resources, the numbers are just mind boggling. We have produced about 1.5 billion tons of iron ore, 6.5 million tons of copper, 300 million tons of salt, 100 million tons of gypsum, and 3.3 billion tons of sand. And all of these are used to make products that we use in our daily lives. And if we had to remine all of the material that was produced in Michigan today, that uh, production would be worth about half a trillion dollars uh, in terms of current economic value. So thank you for listening to this uh, brief introduction to Michigan geology. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, so thank you, Dr. Voice, so much. That was so informative. I know I learned quite a bit. Uh, if you can share your video as well as your audio for just a second so we can actually see you. Awesome, thank you. Um, we did have a question come in from Facebook during your talk. First off, the person said, Dr. Voice rocks. I love that. <laughs> um, but the question was, does Michigan have any earthquake fault lines? Uh, can you hear me fine? I can. Okay. Uh, we have had minor earthquakes in the past decade or so, uh, all on the order of magnitude two to three. And there are faults located in the subsurface here in Michigan, but we are far enough away from the margins of the continent where most of the tectonic stresses actually occur. So the likelihood of a big earthquake event is pretty low. That's good to hear. I do remember a few years ago feeling something. <laughs> so awesome. Um, the one other thing, I don't see any other questions, but I know I learned I didn't realize ore production from Michigan was so predominant. So that is was really cool. That's something I will definitely take away from your talk. So thank you so much. That was just a tiny list of minerals that we produce. There's yeah. quite a few more things that are mined. 
Yeah, it's, I've definitely heard of the copper, but I didn't know about the iron. So that was very, very interesting. So, oh, we did have one other question. This will be our last question because we do need to get on to the next one. But Sarah asks, um, I've heard stories about the gypsum mines in Grand Rapids. Are, are they still active? Are there still active mines in Kent County? Unfortunately, no. So uh, they stopped mining, I believe sometime in the late 90s, but they are actually still using the mines. And so they've converted portions of the mines into um, archival storage and uh, storage for all kinds of different products, food, beer, uh, as well as kind of the records for various counties in Michigan are all stored in this underground facility. That's really it's cool. To go into, it uh, was used as kind of a bomb shelter facility as well. And you can still see some of that historic stuff uh, in the site. I feel like I could learn so much more from you. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So thank you so much, Dr. Voice, for being with us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. As I said, I know I learned a lot and I'm pretty sure everyone else did too, so. Thank you.